Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Van. I am uh, doing an Instagram live with one of my favorite human beings in the whole world uh, very soon. Uh, her name is Valerie Kaur. You're going to get a chance to talk with her. Um, I hope everybody's doing all right. Um, I know this has been a really crazy... Um, uh, hold on a second. Let me see. Is that Valerie? I'm going to try to add Valerie see if it works. Um, but look, I just know it's been a very, very crazy period for everybody. And there she is. Hi, uh, brother. How are you doing, <laughs> sister? I was just, I was just saying to everybody how, uh, what a crazy, we're, we're still not halfway through um, 2020. There's still more 2020 left to do than we've actually gone through so far. And we've already had an impeachment, uh, Kobe Bryant, a plague, uh, uh, curfews, riots, quarantines, <laughs> um, uh, murder hornets, uh, UFOs, UFOs uh, actually confirmed by the U.S. government. You missed that. I one. missed that one. It was, it, that, that's how crazy this situation we're in is, that literally the U.S. The, the US government finally acknowledged that we actually have UFOs released all of the stuff and nobody noticed. <laughs> this is I'm, the first time hearing about it. So, uh, but I'm willing to believe anything now because the things that I thought were impossible are happening, like the, the yeah. horrific stuff and the b amazing stuff. And so, yeah, sure, UFOs. Now there are UFOs. UFOs, yeah. And as somebody said also a hor horrible lynching and the continued brutality. So I want to talk with you. Uh, you're a mom, you're a leader, you're a lawyer, uh, but you're somebody who's actually um, gone through a ton in your own life in terms of you think about the level of hostility in the country, level, level of hatred that people are, being, uh, are directing at Black folks, um, the fight back. Uh, you know, you're somebody, your level of empathy, understanding, insight, and wisdom about all this stuff is unparalleled. You also have a new book that just came out. And so I want you to, if you would be so kind, uh, to just say a few words about why in the middle of all of this crazy stuff that's going on, um, you're offering the world a book of some wisdom. <laughs> this is the book. It's oh, my, this is my third baby, my third child. Yeah, you have to. You have to read. It comes up backwards. You have to read read it to us. Oh, yeah. See no stranger. Yeah. It's called "See No Stranger: A Memoir and Manifesto of Revolutionary Love." You know, Van, I I wrote this book um, for my own survival. I didn't know just how much I would need it now. Like it's coming out tomorrow and I could not have imagined um, the state of the world on publication day. But I knew enough back in 2016, after this president took power, I had been a civil rights activist for 15 years, laboring with brown and black and indigenous communities on the front lines with my own community, with the Sikh community since 9-11. And I thought with every film, with every campaign, with every lawsuit, I thought we were making the nation safer for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And 2016 comes along and I am a new mother. Um, my son was a little, little baby. And I realized after I put him to bed every night that he was growing up in a nation more dangerous for him, a little brown boy with long hair that he would someday wear in a turban. It's part of our faith a nation more dangerous for him than it was for me, or even for my grandfather when he arrived in this country a century ago. And so I had this, I had an existential crisis. Um, I think the only, like the future felt so dark, so dark. And I asked a question after the election that was the question that was keeping me alive. What if? What if this darkness in our nation, in our world, is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our America is not dead, but a nation still waiting to be born? What if the story of America is one long labor, then this is our great transition? And so the midwife says to breathe and to push. And after I made that speech on watch night, I got a thousand people, like literally my inbox was flooded with a thousand people asking me, okay, I'm in, I'm, I'm showing up to the labor, but how do we breathe? 
That's right. How do we push? And I, I needed to answer those questions for myself more than anyone else. And so I got a gift that few women who are mothers and activists get. I got time mm. <laughs> and I got a room of my own and I spent a year living outside the country in the rainforest in Central America. And I took all the books on my shelf. I took every journal I had written since the age of seven and I was pouring through my life as if it was a text. And I was pouring through my sick faith and traditions and history. And I was pouring through social movements of the past from Gandhi to King to Mandela. And I was looking for clues and what emerged for me was so surprising. It was just, it was, I saw these patterns and I, I, I the only word I could muster for what I saw was love. Mm. I began to call it revolutionary love. And so this book, I started writing this book. This book is about why revolutionary love is the call of our times, why revolutionary love is how we birth that new future, now more than ever. Mm -hmm. And when you say revolutionary love, I mean, those two words can go together well, and sometimes they don't go together well. <laughs> um, a lot of times people think about revolution, they think about tearing some stuff up, burning some stuff down, Sometimes you got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so talk to us about revolutionary love. So when I was a little girl, my grandfather would scoop me up on his lap and I would, you know, I'd come home from school after the racial slur. I would just be in tears and he would tell me the stories of our faith and the story of Nanak, Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh faith. After he had his revelation, his words were, I see no stranger. I see no enemy. I can look upon the face of anyone around me and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. And so Papaji would say, my grandfather, he would say, but love, love is dangerous business. In America, they say, I love you, I love you, I love you. All talk, no action. Because if I see you, if I see you as my brother, Van, if I see you as a part of me that I do not yet know, then I have to open my heart to you and to your pain and to your grief. I have to be willing to feel that and let myself be changed by it. And I have to be willing to fight for you when you are in harm's way in the face of injustice. And so six, my sick ancestors, they were warriors. We were not pacifists, we were warriors. It was called Sant Sapai, the warrior sage. The warrior fights, the sage loves. And so I began to understand it as a call to revolutionary love. So in, in my faith, love has always been dangerous. Love has always been demanding and disciplined and requiring action and a commitment to stay in the fire. And what I think is the problem in this country is not with love, it's the way that we talk about it. I mean, I, I'm a, we're lawyers. I was always taught to be a skeptical of love, to roll my eyes when people talked about thoughts and prayers, and I still do. <laughs> but if love the love is just a rush of feeling that, of course, is too fickle, too sentimental to be anything else. But if we start to redefine love as a form of labor, sweet labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, life-giving, it's a choice we make over and over and over again, then when we love beyond what evolution requires to others who don't look like us, even our opponents and ourselves, then love becomes revolutionary. I believe revolutionary love is how, how we birth the nation that we have longed to see. And it's also how we last. Mm -hmm. It's also how we last. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I think if I were um, like most of the country, um, love is hard to find. I mean, I think my, my, my sense is that on the one hand, we've been stuck in a house. And so, you yeah. know, so we had to find some new ways of seeing each other because, you know, we, we you know, some marriages busted up and some, some kids had to go live with some aunts. I mean, it's been rough. So it's, like, it's, it's not like um, it's been all good. But I guess for me, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this, what I'm calling this great awakening. I'm seeing we went through this period with the, with the virus, with the plague, the pandemic, with being shut in, you know, it was hard for people. And then people finally said, listen, listen, there's too much racial violence. There's too many cops killing people. There's too many, too many dead bodies. There's too much pain. There's too, and so 
people put on their masks and braved a pandemic and, and braved a plague to go out and say, listen, enough is enough. You know, quit killing black people, quit shooting black people down. That's a form of love. Um, it's also a form of grief. It's also a form of, which maybe lo love and grief are the same thing, maybe. Um, I think that people are kind of stuck now, though. I want to talk to you about that. I kind of feel that people are, like, we're, it, we're, we're, it, we're, we're, we're in between. Like, mm -hmm. we, we're, we're, we know that maybe more is possible than we thought because nobody thought that you could shut the whole country down and see birds and dolphins and stuff come back, you know, <laughs> like, probably, like, so that was weird. And then nobody thought you would see a man lynched the way that this brother was just lynched by a police officer. That was a lynching. You never thought you'd see something that terrible. But then you also never thought you would see like all these people out here marching, risking their lives. Yeah, millions and millions of white people. They had a Black Lives Matter uh, march in Idaho. Uh, there ain't no black people in Idaho. <laughs> and you know, you have white people holding up signs talking about Black Lives Matter. So, so it's like, there's so much more pain and so much more hope than we used to have in the process, guess what I'm saying. Judge a process, a lot of despair and also a lot of hope. Um, you know, and you've, you've kind of done that. You know, you had somebody in your family murdered of a hate crime. Um, you know, you're a mom through, through this whole, whole period. Uh, but like you said, you got out of the country and you somehow were able to find, you know, something in yourself. What do you hope that those of us who are still struggling with this can find within ourselves? You are brave, my love. That's what I want to tell everyone. That you are brave enough to feel this grief. And you are brave enough to feel this rage. And you are brave enough to show up to do your part in this long labor. Every single one of us has a role. I think I've been plagued my whole life with a little voice in my head who's like, you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not beautiful enough. You're not um, brilliant enough. You're not white enough. You're not sick enough. You're not enough. And it took so long for me to tap that deepest wisdom inside of me. I call her wise woman <laughs> for the Audre Lorde, black feminist says, we must learn to mother ourselves. I remember I was holding my baby and like, oh my love, you are, you are good and you are beautiful and you are just and you are. And my husband was like, why don't you talk to yourself that way? <laughs> and it took me a long time. I had to yeah, practice. Right. I had a journal where I had to practice talking to myself. Like you are, you are enough. You are, you are brave enough to do this thing in front of you. I know all of us are tired. I am so tired. My husband's downstairs with my two small children, five and one. I'm trying to show up to like keep up with the news every day and try to understand the, the quality of this revolution that is touching every corner of our country and our world. Something I never thought I would live to see, even as I'm trying to reckon with the latest news of the lynchings here in, in Los Angeles. I, it, it, is, it is breathless. It is breathless. I know that you are tired. Each of us is carrying a heavy load and some of you are carrying that load more than others. And I just want to tell you that you are enough and you are brave enough to face this and to find your role. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna be one long labor. And this, this is what I really wanna tell you, Van, that you know, Dr. King's voice has always been in my ear. Um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, right? So I always had this straight line in my mind, <laughs> the straight line of linear progress. My grandfather sacrificed so that I would da da da. And that, that picture of history began to fall apart for me after 9-11, after Bilbir Singh Sodhi, Bilbir uncle was killed in a hate crime, his, his death turned me into an activist. And so I spent the next 15 years trying to make it so that our people would stop dying. And now <laughs> my son is growing up in this nation, right? So then I, I, if I think about history as one linear line, that, I mean, we are sliding backwards into darkness. But if we think about history as one long labor, the story of America as one long labor, then progress during birthing labor is cyclical, not linear, it's cyclical. So yes, this moment right now, 2020, feels like 1968. It feels like 1992 and we are re-traumatized as people of color to those previous moments, that same fear, that same trauma, that same rage, that same pain. 
And yet with every turn through the cycle, a little bit more space opens up for equality and justice. You said it. Non-Black people of color, white people in the streets and numbers that we have never seen, that we never thought we would see. I don't know how many more turns to the cycle it will take, but I want to do my part <laughs> to show up for my babies, to breathe and to push. And, and, and here's the thing about the body and labor. Just like the body and labor, we carry embodied knowledge about how to breathe and push. Our ancestors, the movements that came before us. And so this is what I wish to tell you. Love, I mean, joy is the gift of love. Grief is the price of love. Anger is the force that protects what is left. And so we are grieving because we love. We are raging because we love. We are fighting because we love. And it's not like we've done things wrong in the past, no. Our ancestors got it right. They knew how to labor. They know how to be brave. And they're, I think of my ancestors as like whispering in my ear the way that I want to whisper to you, you are brave, my love. You are brave. Just breathe and push and draw on that ancestral memory for how. Mm -hmm. And that's the wisdom I was trying to consolidate here. Yeah, no. I want all of you who are tired to stay in the labor. And there are mm -hmm. these 10 core practices of revolutionary love, including grieving and raging and breathing and pushing that are all laid out here to help us. Well, you know, I, I think it's really uh, important. Um, you know, for me, I think, first of all, uh, people are reading stuff now. I mean, people <laughs> in general, like, uh, you know, so to look at the bestseller list and to see it's all these black people and white people writing about race and racism and stuff like that. Uh, you cannot even get a copy of White Fragility. You cannot get a physical copy of white fragility because you know people want it. So your book, uh, which is See No Stranger, which you can you can actually get a physical copy of your book <laughs> as well as on Kindle and everything else. Um, this is the time when people are questing. People are trying to figure this stuff out. People want to learn. People want to know. People want to understand. And um, I've never seen this. Uh, first of all, to see 30, 40 million white people going up to every black person they know saying, uh, what am I supposed to do? You know, at first people were like, black people were getting annoyed. You know, it's <laughs> like, hey, um, you know, leave me alone. <laughs> like, I don't want to have to hear all of your pain and suffering as white people. I just saw a black man lynched. I just, you know, I got my own problems. I think, you know, now people are starting to realize, wait, hold on a second. We've been here for 400 years. I'm a ninth generation American. Uh, and I'm the first one in my family that was born with all my rights recognized by this government. Mm. I'm a ninth generation American. Mm. And this is the first time I've seen white people asking black people for leadership. Mm. I, it's my first time I've seen white people in their millions trying to people of color and saying, I actually need you to teach me something. Yeah. That is a mass, that is a big deal. That is a non trivial development. That is something that you have to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Are we ready as people of color to answer the call? And I think that we are, but we have to know that we are. And I think we need uh, new language and new models and just new ways because you know the old conversation has not been working, even those of us who have been having it. And that's what I like about your book. Um, it, it gives a new literature, a new literacy. Um, you know, when, when Michelle Alexander, my good friend, came out with the new Jim Crow, it yeah. gave us a new language. It gave us new, new literacy. We had, had terms and points of reference and stuff that we didn't have before. And it moved the conversation forward. Um, and, you know, Michelle is very, I've known her since we were teenagers. Uh, she's very religious. She's very spiritual. She doesn't lead with that, though. She leads with the facts. She leads with the story and, you know, beautiful um, power as a, as a writer. What I love about you is you, know, you put your, your spirituality right there on, you know, on, on the front page, uh, you being... <laughs> Uh, a part of a religious minority makes that a lot more likely. But I see your book as a key tool, as a new uh, weapon, you know, in a revolutionary struggle for love to prevail. Um, I think that you being a woman, uh, like, you know, you're talking about labor. Well, my... Uh, <laughs> My experience of labor was just staring aghast <laughs> <laughs> at Janice squeezing out the kid. Like, 
I didn't learn that much. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I got the ice chips. You know, I was like, here's some ice, you know, how you just <laughs> go, baby. So the wisdom that you bring forward as a woman um, and the way that, you know, you, your, 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 your perspective as a person of color, as a woman of color, as a woman of faith, all that informing the book, I think it shows up at the right time because we need a new set of reference points. We need a fresh conversation that is the same time tied into ancient values. And so I really encourage everybody to get the book. Um, also, you know, my view is that, um, you know, when Michelle's book first came out, The New Jim Crow, if you haven't gotten that book, you can get that book too. Um, it took a while for it to build because people were so shocked. It was like, it was so unusual. It's like, I mean, I told it myself, I said, nobody's gonna read your book, but <laughs> me and your husband, because this book's a book about two things nobody cares about, black people in prison. Nobody's <laughs> gonna read this book. And, and, and I was right for about two months. <laughs> And then people started realizing it was meeting such a need. I think that you're going to be on a similar trajectory in that um, I think you're scratching itches people don't even know that we have. Mm. That's what I think. You know, I called you yesterday, Van. <laughs> so you were a mess. Of, of panic. <laughs> I was like, Van, I've worked on this book my whole adult life. The name of the, oh, wait, the name of the book is See No Stranger. See No Stranger. <laughs> I wish if I if I was smart, I would have some way to like make that um, know, like visible the whole time. But I'm not very technological. I apologize. It's seenostranger.com is where yeah. people can order it and check it out. But I've yeah, though my whole adult life, I have been writing, collecting the stories and the wisdom that's gone in this book. It's like a tapestry. It's like a tapestry, and it's my truest, most beautiful offering to the conversation about race and justice in America from a sick perspective woman of color perspective that hasn't been heard. And I knew it was going to be difficult to release this book under this administration. I didn't know I'd be releasing it during a global pandemic and a revolution, <laughs> like book tour canceled, bookstores closed, media spinning out. You know, I am relying just on my people, just mm -hmm. on my people to spread, to like book, take the book and give it to another and give it to another and spread the word. And I, I remember I, um, I have this last line in the book about measuring our success as people, not based purely on outcomes, but based on our faithfulness to the labor. Mm. Can we just stay in the labor, our mm. longevity? And so I'm practicing that now. <laughs> and I also feel like that is the offering of the book for all of you. How do you stay in the labor? when it's this long and hard and dark and violent and cruel and ongoing mm. 2020 election, like that's, we haven't even gotten to the election yet. <laughs> like, we are not oh, even we make it to, to next to tomorrow, let alone November, let alone the next year. How do we stay in the labor? And so this, this um, framework, you know, the midwife doesn't say breathe once and push the rest of the way. She says, breathe and then push and then breathe again. So I want the millions of people who are marching the streets, chanting, holding up that signs. I want when they go back to their homes and they sit with their kids and they think about how they're showing up at their workplaces, how they're voting, how they're talking to their, I want them, I want to give them some tools for how to do that in love and how to last. Yeah. I think laboring in joy is the meaning of life. I know that injustice has gone on long before I was born. It will go on long after I die. I want to be an old woman, Van. I want to grow old with you. I yeah. want to grow old together. Me so too. this this book is um, how I know I will last. And I want all of you to last too. Well, look, um, I, I want to do this again in a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of days or whatever. I love talking to you. <laughs> I want more people to, to hear your voice and to know your name. For those of you who um, didn't know Valerie before, and it's your first time hearing about her, go to seenostranger.com and share what she's doing. We do not have enough people who are trying to stand in the breach for love. Now, you got people who want no, uh, you know, who just want love to be this kind of weak thing yeah. and just like everybody love and get along even though there's injustice, even though the system is killing the planet. She ain't that. She wants to use love as a way to save people and to fight for people and to lift people up and to bring people together. There's just not enough of that. 
And look, I tell you right now, if she came out right now saying, you know, F this and F that, and I hate this person and blah, blah, blah. Like she got a lot of attention. She saw a lot of books. She just be a part of the problem. <laughs> we got to have a movement and we got to have, you know, uh, a community of people and a growing network of people who can help people win when they're doing it the right way. Like right now, the best way to win in public life is to fail kindergarten. <laughs> to be mean, to be selfish, refuse to share anything with anybody. If you're <laughs> failing kindergarten, you're going to sell a lot of books. You're going to get a lot of likes and retweets. You're just going to be a part of the problem. So we have somebody who, you know, is trying to be a part of the solution. Um, and people like that need to win. We need to, if, we, if you don't like the divisiveness, if you don't like all the BS and the hatefulness and the this and that, then what you have to do, we have to share and like on the good stuff. We have to buy the books that, you know, are pushing things in a better direction and lift up new voices. And there's no better voice to lift up uh, right now than Valerie. The book is See No Stranger. Uh, pick it up. Um, and I'm gonna, we're going to be back on this, you know, bugging people uh, for a couple more weeks. Um, but let other people know uh, we got a real one here with this one. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Love Thanks, you, everybody. Okay, bye. Oh, wait, hold on one second. Wait, hold on. Oh. There's some little thing here. Oh. I see a lot of hearts. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I'm sorry. Uh, lots of hearts. And I, I'll give you some hearts, too, if I can find them. I'm not good, <laughs> I'm not good at this stuff. But I'm, I'm for it. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>